Welcome to this lesson on enthalpy changes in solution. Before we begin, we're going to recap some of the content we looked at last lesson, so please complete these starter tasks and then come back to check your answers. What we need to do is match the key term to its definition, so we'll begin with lattice enthalpy. For lattice enthalpy, we should have got the enthalpy change that accompanies the formation of one mole of an ionic compound from its gaseous ions under standard conditions. Next up, we've got the first electron affinity, that means to gain an electron. So what we should have got for this one is the enthalpy change when one electron is added to each atom in one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of gaseous one minus ions. The enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements under standard conditions, with all reactants and products in their standard states. The enthalpy change of atomization is the enthalpy change that accompanies the formation of one mole of gaseous atoms from an element in its standard state under standard conditions. And then finally, for second ionisation energy, which I didn't give you last lesson, you just needed to write an alteration of the definition for the first ionisation energy. So we should have got the enthalpy change required to remove one electron from each one plus ion in one mole of gaseous one plus ions to form one mole of gaseous two plus ions. Next up, we need to associate an enthalpy change with each of these arrows. These are parts of a Born-Harbor cycle. In the first example, you can see that the only change is sodium gaseous atoms forming one plus sodium gaseous ions. So what we're looking at here is the first ionization energy of sodium. In the next example, we can see we're going from elements in their standard states, sodium solid and chlorine gas as a molecule, to one mole of an ionic compound in its standard state. So actually what we're looking at here is an enthalpy change of formation for sodium chloride. In the next example, our change is oxygen one minus ions to oxygen two minus ions, both gaseous. So what we're looking at here is the second electron affinity of oxygen. You'll notice that this is endothermic, as remember that energy is required to overcome the force of repulsion by trying to put an electron into an already negative ion. Finally, you can see that the change that occurs here is we're going from a molecule of oxygen, half a molecule, to just oxygen atoms, which mean that the bonds must have been broken within the oxygen. So here what we're looking at is an enthalpy change of atomization for oxygen. So, today what we're going to be looking at are enthalpy changes that are associated with dissolving ionic compounds. And there's a key principle here, which is that like dissolves like. You can see here I've got a diagram of a sodium chloride giant ionic lattice. And we've also got diagrams of water molecules. You'll see that we've labelled the partial charges on the water molecule. Now you'll notice and should remember that water is a polar molecule. And this is because it has a permanent dipole with delta negative charges or slight negative charges on the oxygen atoms due to its higher electron negativity and lone pair of electrons. And there are delta positives on the hydrogens. This tells us that water is a polar molecule. Well, sodium chloride is also a polar compound. And this is because they're comprised of positively charged and negatively charged ions. So if we add sodium chloride to water, then we should get aqueous sodium ions and aqueous chloride ions during the dissolving process. And there will be an accompanying enthalpy change for this. Once this enthalpy change has taken place, you will have chloride ions completely surrounded by water molecules. And because the chloride ion is negatively charged, it will be surrounded by the delta positive charges of the polar water molecule upon the hydrogens. The sodium ion is the opposite of this, where it is positively charged, it will be surrounded by the delta negative charges of the oxygen atoms on the polar water molecules. Notice how the ions are completely surrounded by water molecules. So the water molecules are able to break up the giant ionic lattice, and they do so by overcoming the strong forces of electrostatic attraction. And this change that we see here is known as the enthalpy change of solution going from the ionic compound in its standard state, typically a solid, to the ions completely surrounded by water being aqueous. We have a definition for the enthalpy change of solution, which is here. The enthalpy change when one mole of a solute dissolves in a solvent, where the solvent is water, and the resultant ions or entities are completely surrounded by water molecules as aqueous ions or entities. <laughs> 
We have a key question here, which is whether our enthalpy change of solution will be either endothermic, meaning that we'll have to put energy in to dissolve the ionic compound, or whether it's exothermic, meaning that energy will be released when we dissolve the ionic compound. If the enthalpy change was endothermic, then energy would be absorbed, so we would notice this as a cooling of the water. So the temperature of the solution would decrease after adding the ionic compound. If the enthalpy change was exothermic, then energy would be released as a result of dissolving the ionic compound. So you would notice this as an increase in the temperature of the solution by experiment. But whether the enthalpy change of solution is endo or exothermic is not fixed. It completely depends on the compounds, and we'll discuss these factors later on. The enthalpy change of solution can be calculated via an experiment, and you've probably done this experiment before. You should remember the experiment we did where you had a polystyrene cup. You placed it in a beaker to make sure that it stood up, and you put water into the polystyrene cup, and then you dissolved a solid in it, having measured the starting temperature beforehand, and then you measure the final temperature. You then go ahead and use Q equals MC delta T to calculate the energy change, and then you divide the energy change by the number of moles of compound dissolved in order to work out the enthalpy change of solution. So none of this should be new. So what we need to do is dissolve a known mass of the solid in a known mass or volume of water. Then we're going to measure the starting temperature and the final temperature in order to calculate the temperature change using a thermometer. And then finally, you're going to use Q equals MC delta T and follow that up with Q over N, where you divide the energy change in joules by the number of moles in order to calculate the enthalpy change per mole. You'll also need to convert that Q into kilojoules by dividing by 1000. M in this equation, remember, is the mass of liquid being heated, not the actual mass of the compound that you first dissolved, which is why it's quite often important to know the volume of water or solvent, because you can then use its density to calculate its mass to get this M value here. Remember, the mass of the solid actually being dissolved is only ever used to calculate its moles, so you can then divide Q by N to get the per mole energy change. We can imagine the dissolving process using a Born Harbor cycle. Let's start with the solid ionic compound that we intend to dissolve. You would take a polystyrene cup, fill it with a known volume of water, weigh the solid ionic compound, and measure the starting temperature of the water. You would then add the solid ionic compound, dissolve it, and measure the final temperature, and you'd get a temperature change. That temperature change could be used in the Q equals MC delta T equation, to get Q, the energy change. You would then divide that energy change Q by 1000 to get it in kilojoules. And then you would divide that energy change Q by N, the number of moles of compound that you dissolved, in order to get the enthalpy change of solution. The enthalpy change of solution would be the equivalent of actually dissolving the ionic compound. So we would end up with aqueous ions as the product here. But we could also envisage a different route. Imagine that you've got your gaseous ions and there's a couple of different ways you could get from these gaseous ions to your aqueous ions. If you go from gaseous ions straight to the ionic compound, then that's a lattice enthalpy. So we could start here, gaseous ions, undergo the lattice enthalpy to form the ionic compound and then undergo the enthalpy change of solution to get to your aqueous ions. As an alternative route, you could go directly from your gaseous ions to your aqueous ions, which would be called this, the enthalpy change of hydration. Enthalpy change of hydration has a definition. It is the enthalpy change when one mole of gaseous ions is completely surrounded by water to form one mole of aqueous ions as an infinitely dilute solution. So we can see we've constructed a born harbor cycle, which includes the enthalpy change of solution and a new enthalpy change called the enthalpy change of hydration. And with all born harbor cycles, or energy cycles of any variety, your equivalent roots are equal to each other. So, starting at the gaseous ions, going to the solid ionic compound, going to the aqueous ions, root 1, will be equal to root 2, going directly from the gaseous ions through the enthalpy change of hydration to get to the aqueous ions. Because we have equivalent roots, we're able to calculate any of these values if they are unknown. It's important to note that the enthalpy change of hydration doesn't occur in one overall step like this, because I've actually shown two changes occurring here. 
I've actually shown the enthalpy change of hydration of sodium, which would take us about halfway down, and then you would have the enthalpy change of chloride, which would take us the further way down. So normally this enthalpy change of hydration is divided into steps for each ion that you need to hydrate, which we'll see in the next example. A second point to note is that I said earlier that this enthalpy change of solution here may be either endothermic or exothermic. In this particular example, it's endothermic. So energy would be absorbed as the sodium chloride dissolves. You would notice that in a cooling of the solution. So the final temperature would be lower because that energy has been absorbed. However, if this was an exothermic change, this arrow would be going down. So you would have your aqueous ions below the solid ionic compound and that would release energy. So the temperature of the solution would increase. So now let's have a look at an example of using a born harbour cycle to calculate an enthalpy change of solution. We're provided with some values here and we're also provided with this born harbour cycle. So let's have a look at what's going on here. You've got your solid ionic compound and then you've got your aqueous ions. So this change here would be the enthalpy change of solution. Alternatively, we can start at the gaseous ions and they can undergo the lattice enthalpy to form the solid ionic compound and then that can undergo the enthalpy change of solution to form the aqueous ions. That's one route there. Alternatively, we could start at the gaseous ions and hydrate each of the ions. First, the potassium ion undergoes hydration. Then, the fluoride ion undergoes hydration, going from gas to aqueous, gas to aqueous. Notice how the enthalpy change of hydration here has been split into two steps. So, making the gaseous ions our starting point, we have two equal routes to get to the aqueous ionic compound. The first route it undergoes the lattice enthalpy and then the enthalpy change of solution and we end up with aqueous ions. The second route, we simply hydrate each of the gaseous ions to form aqueous ions. Aqueous potassium, then aqueous fluoride, we're done. So this route here is equal to this route here. Another thing to notice about this cycle is in this particular case, the enthalpy change of solution is exothermic, hence the reason why changing from the solid to the aqueous ions, the arrow is going down. We've had to reconstruct the born harbour cycle to a slightly different shape to achieve this. Now what we need to do is use the values provided in order to calculate this value here, the enthalpy change of solution. And remember that the sum of these values is equal to the sum of these values because they are equivalent routes to the same goal, starting at the same point, ending at the same point. So we can mathematically say that if we took the lattice enthalpy and added it to the enthalpy change of solution, it would be equal to the sum of each of the hydration enthalpies in this particular case. We now need to rearrange this for the enthalpy change of solution. So we can say that the enthalpy change of solution is equal to the sum of these values minus this value here, which would give us the enthalpy change of solution. Now all we need to do is substitute our values in paying careful attention to the sign applied to each. So, minus 320 for the enthalpy change of hydration of potassium, plus minus 524 for the enthalpy change of hydration of fluoride, and then take away from that the lattice enthalpy. And we should get an enthalpy change of solution as minus 43 kilojoules per mole. Now let's have a look at a slightly different example. Again, we're provided with a born harbour cycle. Let's consider the born harbour cycle before we move on. Let's start at the gaseous ions. You could go from the gaseous ions to form sodium chloride, and then from sodium chloride as a solid through the enthalpy change of solution to get to the aqueous ions. Notice this time how the enthalpy change of solution arrow is pointing upwards, which tells us this is an endothermic process in that it would absorb energy and the solution would cool down. Alternatively, we could start at the gaseous ions, or we could hydrate each of those ions. First, I hydrate the sodium ion, enthalpy change of hydration of sodium, and then second, I hydrate the chloride ion, enthalpy change of hydration of chloride. Both of these routes start with the gaseous ions, but finish with aqueous ions, so they are equal to each other. We now need to use these values here to calculate the lattice enthalpy, this value here. And remember that root 1, all of this, is equal to root 2, all of this. So we can say that the lattice enthalpy plus the enthalpy change of solution is equal to the sum of the hydration enthalpies. And therefore, if we subtract the enthalpy change of solution from the sum of hydration enthalpies, we'll be left with the lattice enthalpy. Let's substitute in our values and get an answer. 
Here we go, we've put our values into the equation and we've come out with a value for the lattice enthalpy being minus 788 kilojoules per mole, which is expected of a lattice enthalpy to be exothermic because it's bond formation. Now let's have a look at another example where we're asked to calculate an enthalpy change of hydration. Remember, the enthalpy change of hydration is always split into two parts. There's first the enthalpy change of hydration of one of the ions, then the enthalpy change of hydration of another ion. You'll notice here though, with this particular compound, calcium bromide has the formula CaBr2. So therefore, if we were going from gaseous bromine, bromide ions, then we would need to hydrate them twice because we've got two of them. So whatever the enthalpy change of hydration of bromide is, would need to be doubled in any sums. So let's have a look at our cycle. We could start with the gaseous ions and undergo the lattice enthalpy to form the solid ionic compound. That solid ionic compound could then undergo its enthalpy change of solution, which in this case is exothermic because it releases energy, to form the aqueous ions. Alternatively, we could go directly from those gaseous ions and hydrate each of them. The first being the hydration of the calcium ions to form aqueous calcium ions. The bromine remains a gas because we haven't hydrated it yet. And then next, the bromine would need to undergo twice the enthalpy change of hydration of bromide in order to get to aqueous bromide ions. So we need to calculate an enthalpy change of hydration. Let's have a look to see which one's missing. We've got the lattice enthalpy of formation for calcium bromide here. We've got that value. We've got the enthalpy change of hydration for bromide here. And we've got the enthalpy change of solution here. So the enthalpy change that we need to determine is this one here, the enthalpy change of hydration of calcium ions. Well, let's consider our roots. The lattice enthalpy plus the enthalpy change of solution is one route to get to the aqueous ions from the gaseous ions. Our other route is the enthalpy change of hydration of calcium plus twice the enthalpy change of hydration of bromide because I've got two of them. We need to rearrange for this value here. So we can say that the sum of these enthalpy changes take away this enthalpy change here is equal to the enthalpy change of hydration of calcium. So let's substitute in our values and we should end up with a value for the enthalpy change of hydration of calcium ions being minus 1579 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so thanks very much for watching that. I hope you found the explanations clear. What we'll be doing next is having a look at some exam questions. So if you could open up the pack and have a look at those. Um, try and attempt the ones that you think you can. There might be some wordy ones there that you're not sure quite how to word your answers. So what I'm going to be doing is running a live session on Thursday of this week where we work through some of those problems together. So please do attend that and have a look for the exact timings on your Google Classroom. Thanks very much.